Gaius Octavius Thurunus, who was later known as Caesar Augustus, was born in 63 BCE. According to Julius Marathus, a few months before Augustus was born, a prodigy was observed at Rome, which announced the nature was bringing forth a king for the Roman people. The Senate was mostly afraid of this and agreed that no child should be born or raised in this year. Similar to the story we get from King Herod in the slaughter of the innocents, except in this sense, the Senate during a Republic era was afraid of having a king. Those whose wives were pregnant ensured that the decree was not registered in the treasury, since each hope that the prodigy referred to his was their own child. In the books of Asclepiades of Mendes, entitled Theologimena, that Atia, mother of Octavian, attending the sacred rites of Apollo, fell asleep in the middle of the night. While asleep, a serpent slid up to her, then quickly went away. On waking, she purified herself. At once, there appeared on her body a mark and the image of a snake, and she was never able to get rid of it. Ten months later, Augustus was born, and this is why he was believed to be the son of Apollo. Atia, before she gave birth, dreamed that her insides were carried to the star and spread over all the earth and the skies. Octavius, the father, dreamed that the sun rose from Atia's womb. On the day Augustus was born, when the conspiracy of Catiline was being discussed in the Senate House, and Octavius stayed away until late because his wife was in labor, when informed of the hour of the birth, asserted that the master of the world was born. Octavius, leading an army through remote regions of Thrace, sought guidance concerning his son at some barbarian rituals in the grove of Father Liber, otherwise known as Dionysus or Bacchus. The same prediction was made by the priest, for a great flame had leaped up when they poured wine onto the altar that had passed beyond the peak of the temple roof and right up to the sky, a portent which had only previously occurred for Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great offered sacrifice at that same altar and on the very next night thereafter, Octavius dreamed he saw his son of greater than mortal size with a thunderbolt and a scepter and emblems of Jupiter best and greatest and a radiant crown on chariot decorated with laurel drawn by 12 horses of astonishing whiteness. The same year he was born, 63 BCE, Marcus Agrippa was also born in that year, who would go on to be his right-hand man, who would help him get the throne. Two important deaths happened in that year, Mithridates VI of Pontus, the same Mithridates, whose birth was signified by a star in the east, was killed by Pompey the Great, who also sacked the Temple of Jerusalem and conquered all of the Eastern Roman Empire's realms. This is important because it also is the year that the Pontifus Maximus Metellius Pius died, and they held an election for the new Pontifus Maximus in which Julius Caesar was elected. Julius Caesar is now the high priest of Rome, and this might have a lot to do with why Julius Caesar selected Augustus as his heir and adoption, and here's the reasons why. His sister's son, as still a baby, is recorded in the writings of Gaius Drusus. He was placed one evening by his nurse in his cot on level ground, but the next morning he disappeared. He was found after a long search in a tower of great height where he lay facing the rising sun. When he first began to speak, he ordered some frogs to be silent, who happened to be croaking in his grandfather's villa, 
and they say that from that time no frog croaked there. When he was having a snack in a grove by the fourth milestone along the road to Campania, suddenly an eagle snatched the bread from his hand and after flying up in the air unexpectedly came back and dropping down gently returned it to him. After the dedication of Capitolone Temple, Quintus Catalus had dreams for two nights in succession. First that Jupiter best and greatest when a number of youths were playing around his altar, took one of them aside and placed in fold of his toga the image of the Republic, which he carried in his hand. And on the next night, he noticed the same boy in the lap of Capitoline Jupiter. And when he gave orders that the boy be brought down, this was forbidden by a warning from a god, as the boy was being reared for salvation of the state. When Augustus took on the toga of manhood, his broad stripped tunic was ripped in two and fell at his feet. Some interpreted this as meaning no less than the order whose emblem this was would sometime become subject to him. The deified Julius, in the course of taking over a place for his camp at Munda, when a palm tree was discovered in the wood which was being cut down, gave orders that it be preserved as an omen of victory. From this, a shoot at once sprang forth, which within a few days had so matured that it not only equaled its parent in size, but even overshadowed it, and it was filled with a nest of doves. Even though that breed of bird has a particular aversion to hard and spiky leaves, they say that Caesar was particularly influenced by that sign and wishing for no other successor than his sister's grandson. Having withdrawn to Apollonia, Augustus went with Agrippa to the studio of the astrologer Theogenes, when a great and almost incredible future was predicted for Agrippa, who was the first to put his questions. Augustus concealed the details of his own birth and kept refusing to reveal them through fear or shame that he himself would turn out to be of lesser importance than Agrippa. After much persuasion, he slowly and unwillingly disclosed them. Theogenes jumped up and venerated him. Soon Augustus had acquired such faith in fate that he made public his horoscope and had a silver coin struck with the image of the star sign Capricorn under which he was born. When Julius Caesar was murdered, there was about 300 conspirators along with Marcus Cicero and Marcus Brutus and Cassius. But Julius Caesar had planned ahead. He wrote in his will an adoption plan for Octavian to take on the same name, Gaius Julius Caesar in which Octavian accepts. Within a year of Julius Caesar's murder, Octavian, who is now Gaius Julius Caesar, hunted down all of the conspirators, had them all killed, as well as Cicero and Brutus and Cassius. So to the people of Rome, it looked like Julius Caesar had avenged himself from the grave through the will of his own son, who took on the name of his father, who did the will of the Father. This was seen as a miracle, and Julius Caesar became one of the highest gods in the Roman imperial cult. These are the images of Caesar being taken up into heaven by his mother Venus, the goddess. Now that Caesar adopted Octavian, Octavian was now the son of God. Devious Filius was coins that were minted all over the Roman Empire. Son of God. When the palm tree sprang up from between the joints and the paving in front of his house, he moved it to the inner court of his household gods and took great care to ensure its flourishing. When the most ancient oak tree on the island of Capri was branches withered and drooped to the ground, recovered it at his arrival. He was so delighted that he handed over an area to the city of Naples in exchange for the island. As for the religious customs of foreigners, some he regarded with reverence as ancient and traditional, while the rest he held in disdain. 
for he was initiated into the mysteries of Eleusis and the mysteries of Athens. And when later, at Rome, he was sitting in judgment in case concerning the privileges of the priest of Athenian Demeter, and some rather secret matters were being discussed, he sent away the court and the crowd of bystanders and heard the disputes alone. On the other hand, not only did he omit to make small detour to see the Apis bull of Serapis when traveling through, but he even praised his grandson Gaius because on a journey through Judea, he did not pay his respects in Jerusalem because this would mean that he's acknowledging that the Jewish God is the true God. Augustus was actually held in high regard by many of the Hellenized Jews. For example, Philo Judaeus says, This Caesar, who calmed the storms, which were raging in every direction, who healed the common diseases, which were afflicting both Greeks and barbarians, who descended from the south and from the east, and ran on and penetrated as far as north and west, in such a way as to fill all the neighboring districts and waters with unexpected miseries. This is he who did not only loosen, but utterly abolish the bonds in which the whole of the habitable world was previously bound and weighed down. This is he who destroyed both the evident and the unseen wars, which arose from the attacks of robbers. This is he who rendered the sea free from vessels of pirates and filled it with merchantmen. This is he who gave freedom to every city who brought disorder into order, who civilized and made obedient and harmonious nations which before his time were unsociable, hostile, and brutal. This is he who increased Greece by many Greeces and who Hellenized the regions of the barbarians in their most important divisions and guardian of peace, the distributor of every man of what was suited to him, the man who proffered to all the citizens' favors with the most ungrudging liberality, who never once in his whole life concealed or reserved for himself anything that was good or excellent. Herod built three temples to Augustus in the lands of Judea, one of them in Samaria, the other one in Caesarea, and a third one on the road to Damascus. These were known as Sebastes, or in Latin, an Augustorium. The name Augustus was a title given to him upon being initiated into the mysteries. According to Cassius Dio, when the name Augustus was granted to Caesar, the Senate was signifying that he was something more than human, since indeed, all the most precious and sacred objects are referred to as Augusta. For this reason, when he was addressed in Greek, he was named Sebastos, meaning an august individual. The word is derived from the passive form of the verb sabatso. Then by being by virtue of being consecrated in all priesthoods and of being entitled to confer most of these offices upon others, and because of the fact that even if two or three persons shared the imperial power at the same time, one of them, Pontifus Maximus, they exercised the supreme jurisdiction on matters both profane and sacred. The so-called tribunican power, which was held by men whose influence is rapidly beginning to climb, gives them to right to veto consequences of any measures taken by any other official. Censorship gives them power over the census, the population, consul over in matters in the Senate. The title of Augustus, as I said before, it's similar to like a messiah. Majestic, great, venerable. It literally means to give increase. In Greek, Sebastos, venerable. 30 years before its first association with Caesar's heir, Augustus was an absolute honorific religious title. One earlier context in 58 BCE, Roman household gods were called Augustus. In Latin poetry, it signifies the elevation or augmentation, sacred or religious. Some Roman sources connected it to augury. An augur was a priest is consecrated to declare or set apart as sacred, to sanctify, to initiate, 
or anoint a priest in the order of bishops, or in this case, augurs, was considered to be in equilibrium with the sacra or sacred things, and were not only way by which the gods made their will known, but were also healers and prophets. So the term Augustus is basically equivalent to something like a messiah. He is the first person to get this title. This title would change over time and sort of become a Roman title for the heir of a Caesar. But at the time it was given to Augustus, this was a purely religious title for the highest known title of all people in the religion. He was already the Pontifus Maximus, which he stole from Marcus Lepidus. But now he was the Augustus. He was the highest of all. He was the highest augur, the prophet, the mediator between God and man. That was what the title of Augustus actually means. The Greek version of this word is Sebaste, which gets its root from the term Sabatios, who is the Phrygian version of Zeus. Saba Zeus is the name. And there's a connection to the Jewish God as well. According to Valerius Maximus, the Romans identified the Jewish Jehovah Zavaot as Jove Sabatios. So the title of Augustus in the Eastern Roman Empire was a claim to being God's anointed one. When Octavian was given the name Augustus, straight away on the very same night, according to Cassius Dio, a portent occurred which made no small impression on him. The Tiber overflowed its banks and flooded the all-lying districts of Rome, so that these became navigable to boats. From this sign, the soothsayers prophesied that he would attain great power and hold the whole city under his sway. Augustus finally conquered all of the Roman Empire and he had nobody in his way. Mark Antony and Cleopatra were now dead. All the titles from Pontifus Maximus to the power of the Tribune, Roman censor, praetorship, consul, Divius Filius, son of God, and Imperator. Another title given to him was Princeps. The Princeps was a Latin word meaning first in time or first or foremost. He is the first citizen of the Roman Empire. It's like another Adam, basically. The word prince is derived from princeps. One of his titles was the princeps of peace, princeps pax, which is prince of peace. He dedicated over 82 temples during this period and ushered in 40 years of peacetime until his death. Of the 82 dedicated temples to him, Pax Romana, Dia Roma as well, temples to the divine Julius Caesar. After all, he was the son of God, and Julius Caesar was the father. Augustus' first consulship, when he was taking the auspices, twelve vultures appeared as they had to Romulus, and when he slaughtered the victims, all their livers were found to be double inwards underneath. All the experts agreed in interpreting this as an omen portending a good and great future. When the troops of the Triumvirs had withdrawn to Bononia, an eagle, which came to rest upon his tent, set upon two ravens who were attacking from each side, bringing them to the ground. From this, the entire army drew the conclusion that such a dispute would arise between the colleagues as indeed happened, and predicted what the outcome would be. When Augustus was traveling to Philippi, a Thessalian declared that his victory was assured on the authority of the deified Julius, the father, Patri Patrius, father of the fatherland, whose image had appeared to him when he was traveling along byway. When he was performing the rites to mark the end of the lustrum in Campus Meritus with a great crowd of the people in attendance, an eagle flew around him a number of times, then went over to a nearby temple where it landed on the first letter of the word Agrippa. Noticing this, he instructed his colleague Tiberius to pronounce the vows which it is customary to undertake for the next lustrum. 
For himself, although, the tablets were written out and ready, was not willing to embark upon that he would not bring to a conclusion. At around the same time, the first letter of this was name was struck from the inscription on his statue by a bolt of lightning. This was understood to mean that he would only live for further hundred days, for that the significance of the letter C means a hundred in Latin, and that it would come to pass that he would be included among the gods, for Azer, the remaining part of the name Caesar, means God in the language of the Etruscans. When he defeated Mark Antony at the Battle of Alexandria, he discovered a great obelisk in the city of Heliopolis. This obelisk is today the obelisk in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. It is said to be the same location where St. Peter was crucified on. The deification of Julius Caesar by Ovid in the Mord Metamorphosis. Though Asclepius came as a stranger to our temples, Caesar is God in his own city outstanding in war or peace. It was not so much his wars that ended in great victories or his actions at home or his swiftly won fame that set him among the stars, a fiery comet as his descendant. There is no greater achievement among Caesar's action that he stood father to our emperor to have earned many triumphs and celebrated few than to have sponsored such a man with whom, as ruler of all, you gods have richly favored the human race. Therefore, in order the emperor not to have been born of mortal seed, Caesar needed to be made a god. When firebrands were seen, burning in the midst of the stars, often drops of blood rained from the clouds, Lucifer, the morning star, was dulled with rust-black spots on his disc, and the moon's chariot was spattered with blood. The descendant of yours you suffer over, Catherian, has fulfilled his time, and the years he owes to the earth are done, you and Augustus, the sun, will ensure that he ascends to heaven as a god and is worshipped in the temples. Augustus, as heir to his name, will carry the burden place upon him alone and will have us with him in battle as the most courageous avenger of his father's murder. Under his command, the conquered walls of besieged Mutina will sue for peace. Pharsalia will know him. Macedonian Philippi twice flow with blood, and the one who holds Pompey's great name will be defeated in Sicilian waters. He had barely finished when gentle Venus stood in the midst of the Senate, seen by no one, and took up the new freed spirit of her Caesar from his body, and preventing it from vanishing into the air, carried it towards the glorious stars. As she carried it, she felt it glow and take fire, and loosed it from her breast, it climbed higher than the moon, and drawing behind it a fiery tail shone as a star. Seeing his son's good works, Caesar acknowledges they are greater than his own, and delights in being surpassed by him. Though the son forbids his own actions being honored above the father's, nevertheless tame, free and obedient to no one's orders, exalts him, despite himself, and denies him in this one thing. So great archery seeds the title to Agamemnon and Theseus outdoes Aegis and Achilles, his father Peleus, and lastly, to quote an example worthy of these two, so Saturn is less than Jove. It is said that when his best friend, who was born in the same year as him, Marcus Agrippa, died, owls kept flitting about the city, and lightning struck the house of the Alban Mount, where the consuls lodged during the sacred rites. The star called the comet, Venus, which was the same star that came when Caesar was, was killed, hung for several days over the city and was finally dissolved into flashes resembling torches. Many buildings in the city were destroyed by fire, among them the hut of Romulus, which was set ablaze by crows which dipped upon the burning meat from some altar. According to Nicholas of Damascus, the Jewish historian, both Mark Antony and Crassus went into the Parthian Empire and failed. Crassus was killed 
but Mark Antony lost his standards and retreated back to Rome. The king of the Parthians in the time of Augustus in 20 BC was Phraates. He had become anxious that Augustus might lead an expedition against him. He was tipped off that Augustus wanted to fulfill the will of his father, which was go as far as Alexander the Great and beyond. Phraates, in fear, returned all the standards and prisoners of war to Augustus and told him that he was bending to his will, making Augustus more powerful than the Parthian Empire. Augustus received the standards and the prisoners as though he had defeated the Parthians in a campaign. He took great pride in the settlement and declared that he had won back without striking a blow what had earlier been lost in battle. Indeed, he gave orders that sacrifices should be voted in honor of his success and that a temple for Mars Ultor, in which the standards were to be dedicated, should be built on the capital in imitation of that of Jupiter Freteris. And he himself carried out both decrees. Besides this, he rode into the capital on horseback and was honored with a triumphal arc. All of these things were done later to commemorate the event. The Parthians and the Arabians and the Africans all were paying tribute at this time, but he could not have the title of king of the world unless the Indians bowed to him. The thoughts were on the table. Should Rome expand its borders and go beyond India? Many delegations visited him, and the people of India were now seeking a treaty of friendship. They sent seven delegators to come down there. Three of them arrived three men of the caste of the Rishis, who Nicholas of Damascus calls three wise men, presented Augustus with oils and presents and tigers. One of the three Indians, named Zarmaris, wished for some reason to end his life. Zarmaris asked Augustus if he could be initiated with him into the mysteries of Eleusis. Augustus agreed, but it was since it was the winter time, the Illusianian rites were closed, but on the request of the Emperor Augustus, they had a specially open day just for this occasion. Augustus and Tsar Maris were both initiated into the rites together. When he was initiated into the mysteries, the man then threw himself, the man Tsar Maris threw himself into a fire and ended his own life. Many odes and epodes were dedicated to Augustus by Virgil, Ovid, Horace, and others. It would take me a full hour to read them all. But for an example, you have just heard, O people of Rome, that Caesar has sought the laurel, whose cost is death. But now, like Hercules, he returns victorious from Spain to the gods of his home. The mothers of maidens and of young men whose lives have just been saved, and you boys and girls, who have not known a husband, beware of ill-omened words. This holy day will truly drive away all my black hairs. I shall have no fear of war or violent death while Caesar is the master of the world. The guest day, D.V. Augusta, the achievements of the deified Augustus, in the Temple of Roma, says this. At age 19, on my own initiative and my own expense, I raised an army by which I restored liberty to the Republic, which had been oppressed by the tyranny of a faction. Those who slew my father, I drove into exile, punishing their deed by due process of law, and afterwards they were waged upon by the Republic. I twice defeated them in battle. Twice I triumphed with an ovation. Thrice I celebrated cure triumphs and was saluted as imperator 21 times. Although the Senate decreed me an additional triumphs, I set them aside when I had performed the vows which I had undertaken. In each war, I des deposited upon the capital the laurels which adorned my fascists. I brought under the sovereignty of the Roman people. I pushed forward frontier Illyricum as far as the bank of the Danube, an army of the Dacians which crossed to the south of the river that was, under my auspices, defeated and crushed. 
embassies were often sent to me from the kings of India, a thing never seen before in the camp of any general of the Romans. From the peoples of the Parthians and the Medes received the kings for whom they asked through ambassadors. The chief men of those people, the Parthians, Vonones, son of King Phraates, grandson of King Orides, the Medes, Ariobarzanes, the son of King Adavazes, grandson of King Ariobarzanes. In my sixth consulship and seventh consulship, when I had extinguished the flames of civil war, after receiving the universal consent, the absolute control of affairs, I transferred the Republic from my own control to the will of the Senate of the Roman people. For this service, on my part, I was given the title of Augustus by decree of the Senate, and the doorposts of my house were covered with laurels by public act, and a civic crown was fixed above my door, and a golden shield was placed in the Curia Julia, whose inscription testified that the Senate and the Roman people gave me this recognition of my valor, my clemency, my justice, and my piety. After that, I took precedence of all rank, but of power I possessed no more than those who were my colleagues in any magistracy. The new works which we built were the Temple of Mars, Jupiter Tonans and Ferretius, Apollo, Deified Julius of Corinus, Minerva, Juno the Queen, Jupiter Libertas of Lares, D. Penates of Youth, the Mother of Gods, Lupercal, the State Box at the Circus, the Senate House, the Chalcedicum, the Augustan Forum, the Basilica, Julia, the Theater of Marcellus, the Grove of the Caesars beyond the Tiber, to the number of 82, the Theater of Pompey, the Aqueducts, the Flaminian Way, All this I have done as the devious Phileus, the Son of God, Savior of Rome, Princeps of Peace.